Thank you very much for this invitation on this great symposium about an event that definitely left an impact. Uh, <laughs> And I would like to start this by acknowledging uh, uh, my first, uh, pretty much the first people that brought me into paleontology. That was 20 years ago, just after high school. And I entered paleontology with advocational paleontologists, uh, this group of, of, uh, of chaps there that started a local museum in Bowman, North Dakota, and set up a research facility that would allow both uh, the public, like me, and also uh, people from academia from all over the world to come over and research the KT boundary right there in the badlands of, uh, of North Dakota. So uh, museums, I, mean, I guess that's an important place. This is a museum, uh, we're in a museum today. Uh, this is my museum in my city, Paris. Uh, this is the hall of, uh, uh, of uh, fossil vertebrates and uh, uh, museums are where we keep objects, we are curious, we collect stuff. And we store them in museum, but not only because those objects are beautiful, but also because they're interesting, they can tell story. Not only we can use those specimens to tell a story about the past, but we can also use those objects from the past to tell a story about today. And this is really why uh, those collections and what we're doing to study the Earth history is, is important. Uh, uh, of course, Paris and Europe was one of the uh, cradle of paleontology. Uh, early on, geologists started to realize that Earth had a, probably a very long history and that this history uh, of, of rock formation, of mountain formation, of erosional canyon formations uh, uh, was probably uh, something that involves slow processes taking millions of years. Uh, and that also uh, those processes that we see in the past were probably the same as what happened today. So erosion 50,000 million years ago was the same as erosion today and so on. So the, the a principle of uniformitarianism and gradualism. Uh, but some events actually uh, break the rule and Cuvier was one of, of the first ones to recognize that and he would see some drastic changes between some layers of rocks. And he, he proposed that at some period of time you have events that were so short that they were catastrophic. They were not gradual as everybody was thinking before. And he brought the idea of catastrophism and some of the mass extinction that I rec recognize, although he identified those as being a complete wiping out of ecosystems and they were starting from spontaneous generation from nothing. But we know today that uh, we're all cousins <laughs> uh, and uh, the theory of evolution shows that we're all linked, we have uh, all ancestors and that there is no spontaneous generation but life is connected together and what we see today is the results of what we saw in the past and what life went through. Uh, again, the uh, geological time scale, uh, I guess today we are talking about the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, which is uh, that one here. This is uh, the last one of the five mass extinction that uh, happened on Earth. Uh, it's pretty cool because it's a mass extinction that happened that in a world that's pretty similar to the one we live in today, we had pretty modern animals. We had also a modern flora. So we could draw some conclusion by looking at what happened at that time with what could happen to the world today. And of course, this is uh, something that we know for this very sad event, uh, but it is not the only thing that happened, and it probably didn't happen like that. <laughs> uh, so what is a mass extinction first? Well, that, that is a good question, and in fact, this is something that is still quite debated among scientists, but uh, the general rules is that it has to affect many species. Uh, it also has, uh, you, you should have extinction rates that are higher than what's happening in the backgrounds. There is extinction every single, uh, all the time. But a mass extinction is a period of time where you're gonna have a rate that accelerates quite dramatically. Many species are getting extinct at the same time. The cause of the mass extinction also differs from the cause of the background extinction. So this is something that's, that's, uh, that's some, something that's anomalous. The event happens very suddenly and quickly in geological time. So we're not talking about like hundreds of millions of years, but something in, in shorter time scales. Uh, it has to have a wide geographical reach and it often uh, can be global, but not necessarily. Uh, it can affect several ecosystems and biomes. So we're talking about what's happening on land, but also in the sea, and that, that can be connected. Uh, and uh, the recovery after the mass extinction is usually done by spreading uh, previously non-dominant species that's gonna recognize the environment and, and take over. Uh, the KT boundary, uh, a lot of things have changed about the understanding of the KT boundary in the 80s when uh, Walter and Luis Alvarez from Berkeley uh, looked for something that was totally unrelated to mass extinction event. They were looking at uh, sedimentation rates. And this is a big question we have as geologists, how much time represent this one meter stack of rock? 
it can represent a day, it can represent a couple million years, is really hard to date. It's still a question today how to date those sediments. And they had the idea of looking at uh, micrometeorites, which are raining upon us every single day. And if you are accumulating a lot of rocks, you're going to have not much micrometeorites in your deposit. But if you're accumulating rocks very slowly, you're going to have a lot of concentration of micrometeorites. And they use iridium, which is rich in micrometeorite, to measure this proportion and hopefully get back those uh, uh, sedimentation rates. Well, they went in Gubbio in Italy on this very famous section, probably also because the food is pretty good. <laughs> and uh, this section has this line that was known for, uh, for quite a bit of time, and they tested their iridium uh, proxy. And they showed this big spike that you see in red right where they're putting their finger, which is an iridium anomaly that's beyond anything that would uh, happen with the normal uh, cosmic micro micrometeorite uh, input. And they theorized in science that, well, uh, we found this signal that is very weird, and we postulate that this is coming from a big asteroid impact, and it's happening at the time of the KT boundary mass extinction. Now, you guys figure it out, <laughs> which was a pretty bold uh, statement. And this is actually what we've been doing for the past now uh, almost 40 years. Uh, so this story is, uh, is uh, summarized into this book, which is a, which is a classic. Uh, and uh, so after Gubbio, people have been looking at KT boundary section worldwide. So this is in Denmark. You have this clear line in the limestone, so in marine environments. Uh, and now we know a couple more. So uh, there is some prediction that could be made. Uh, we saw a great presentation about the crater itself and some, uh, 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 some nice uh, uh, crushed rocks inside the crater. So if we're inside the crater, we, we expect to see a large amount of crushed material. But as we get far away, we are supposed to get thinner and thinner material. So, uh, uh, for example, uh, in New Mexico, we found some tsunami deposits that are about 10 meters thick. Then if we go to uh, uh, North Dakota, we found some ejecta deposits that are about 2 centimeters thick. And back in Europe, it's uh, thinner than that. So that's actually a clue or way to look for the crater. Uh, so that's some of the example of the spherules in, in Haiti. They are uh, very visible, uh, almost pea size, uh, and it's this pretty thick deposit. Uh, in the western interior, this is a Raton Basin. It's this thin layer, white layer, so uh, it's getting thinner. So people have been looking for the impact and using those clues of where to look at. Uh, finally, uh, uh, geologists at the uh, Pemex and Helen Hildebrand found this uh, anomaly, which is uh, revealed by, gravi uh, by it's a gravity anomaly. So the crater is deep into the ground. We can't see it, but we can measure it using gravity. And it has these horseshoe patterns. Uh, the crater happened 66.043 million years ago. It was on a Monday. Uh, <laughs> everybody hates Mondays, so. Uh, the crater is 108 miles diameter. It is one kilometer underground and uh, revealed by gravity anomaly. This is probably the largest crater known on Earth. This is why also it has a peak ring. This is the only example that we have close to us to study. So now we have this great clue, but paleontologists have been debating. Now, how do you link? the fossil record to this impact event. And it, as I said, this is what we've been looking for a long time. So that's a summary of all the, the KT boundary section in the world, uh, both marine and terrestrials. There is actually 105 known terrestrial sections. And as you can see on this diagram, they're mostly concentrated in North America, so US and Canada. Uh, and if we add on top of that the amount of data we know, so how, how much knowledge we have amassed on those sections, uh, it's even worse. Uh, so we can see that pretty much I say 85% of her knowledge on the KT boundary is coming from around here. So uh, there is a lot of effort for a new researcher to come over and find new sections uh, in all those other places in the world. Uh, but that's important to keep in mind as well, is that we're telling a North American story. Uh, so uh, 20 years ago, uh, I landed here in uh, Marmarsh, North Dakota. So you've seen this place a little bit. This was, I must say, a bit exotic for me. Uh, I was just finishing my... Uh, 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 just finishing high school and, uh, and arrived there in uh, uh, southwestern North Dakota. Uh, uh, Slope in Bear Mountain Country has fantastic outcrops that you can see on the, on the left side, that this uh, pinkish uh, uh, band that is actually along the Little Missouri River, which is the, the Benlands outcrop. There is two main towns in Slope County, uh, Marmus and Amidon. Uh, I think Amidon is the smallest county city in the United States. Uh, but uh, that's about it. There's probably more cows and dinosaurs than people around here. <laughs> and uh, so that's Main Street, Marmoth. Uh, there is a bookstore, but it's never open, though. So um, 
There is also a gas station, so in case you uh, get out of the gas, you, you can get out of there as fast as you can, but don't rob the gas station because there is also a jail. So <laughs> it is serious. And I must say that uh, doing field work in, uh, in, in the US is pretty fun. Uh, I was very shocked to see this vehicle popping out of the hill, which is the former field vehicle of the Denver Museum, which in front of has been retired. And I had this vision of... <laughs> <laughs> so I was happy. I posted it online, and my friend from uh, my colleague from France also said, "Hey, I also got my new field vehicle." And I was like, "Well, that's great, but you photoshopped half of it." I was like, "Well." <laughs> so why on earth going there in Marmoris, North Dakota? Well, uh, there's a good reason. It's a, it's it's fossil mecca. There is fossils everywhere, and not only one type of fossils, but you got those beautiful leaf assemblage that you have here. Uh, there is Tyler and Kirk here. Uh, they found this little white knob. Just after 10 minutes of digging, you have this two meter hadrosaur femur uh, sticking out of the ground. So you have this fossil record of animals and plants and you can correlate them together uh, with the KT boundary. So these are some example again of boring uh, uh, triceratops skulls that you find uh, a dime a dozen up there. Uh, and the reason for this cool record is that at, at the time of the end of Cretaceous, you had a uh, vast deltaic floodplain, so very fast accumulation rates, where you could actually bury uh, organism, plants, and animals uh, very fast and preserve them as fossils. We talked about this a little bit, the face has changed, so uh, looking at the KT boundary, which we cannot see at the bare eyes, with the bare eyes, we have another proxy, which is a change between uh, uh, formations. So you have the typical Hell Creek gray, uh, pink, uh, and purples at the bottom, uh, some uh, uh, fluvial, uh, fluvial sediments, and the formation contact, which uh, is a change of uh, deposition environment to more pondent, and you have those yeah, yellow and brown and tans coming in. And we know that the KT boundary is pretty close, so we know that we, we found this contact, we can take a shovel, dig, and hopefully find uh, the impact layer. That doesn't happen everywhere, but when you're lucky, like at Mud Buttes, this is what you will see. And this is the ejecta from the Chicxulub impact. And you have this different layers. You have the boundary clay, which is supersonic uh, ejecta from the impact. And then you have the spheral layer, which are like millimeter beads of glass that rain down on Earth. And then the finer stuff uh, settle, like the, the shock quartz uh, that you've seen before and, and the iridium anomaly. And that is the exact marker of the KT boundary. Um, extinction was not known having dinosaur centric. So the great thing is that they disappeared that line, but this is not the only thing that happened. And mostly the, the KT boundary should be an extinction that englobe everything. So it should not be dinosaur centric, but it should also explain the collapse of ecosystems, both in the marine realm and also with plants. Uh, so of course, uh, T-Rex short arm is not a good explanation for the KT boundary. <laughs> so I've been interested in plants uh, and um, Ian showed that the the plant war during the, the KT boundary was actually fairly modern. So uh, all those plant groups uh, th that we had uh, in the Cretaceous were basically dominated by uh, this, this red group here, the endosperm, the flowering plants. So we would have forests that would probably look very similar than what we have today. Uh, unlike, for example, work, w walking in a Permian forest, we would be totally, uh, 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 we, we, we would not be able to recognize anything. So it was a modern forest that was looking like today. And as I said, well, plenty of dinosaurs out there that always make Tyler happy, but the great thing about bones is that you have dirt around it. And in fact, I don't need the bone, I just need the dirt. And this is what I study. So uh, we do those big trenches to study the, the fossil pollen record of those very, very small uh, fossils produced by plants. Uh, there's a lot of them. So in the volume uh, that of sediment that's re represented by these dyes, you can easily recover 100,000 pollen grains and spores. So lots and lots of data in a tiny amount of rocks. And we can study that millimeter by millimeter almost. Uh, why is that? Well, plants do produce pollen to reproduce and they disperse it, as this example shows. So all these pollen grains will rain in uh, river systems and, and you can find in preserve. Who's allergic to pollen, by the way? <laughs> I am. <laughs> Okay, let's get out. So, uh, so you dig the rock, you dissolve it in very strong acid, and then you go back to the lab and you can use the uh, optical microscope here or the SEM to look at those beautiful uh, pollen, pollen, and, uh, pollen grains and spores. Pelinology also englobes a lot of things. Uh, so it's also the study of marine algae, uh, like dinoflagellates or acritarchs. You can also find uh, all sorts of things that are organic because the acid is dissolving the mineral fraction. So you can find fungal spores, insect parts, 
uh, uh, marine forams. Uh, you can also find plant parts like cuticles, wood fragment, charcoal, organic matter. So you can also derive a lot of information about the depositional environment. Uh, what was the world like, the plant world like during the end of the Cretaceous? Well, just like today, the flora was different across the globe. If you looked at the flora in New Zealand, it's going to be very different from the Arctic forest today. And the Cretaceous was no different. And in the area that, that we're interested in, North America, we were in this zone that's called the Aquilipodonides province. And this complex name just reflects the diversity of those. Uh, it's a genera of pollen, uh, which you can see here. And this only occurs in this northern province. Uh, so if we look at the KT boundary, we're going to look at these. And the, the interesting thing is that most of those pollen on this plate actually go extinct right at the boundary, just like the dinosaur did. So we can use them as a very good indicator. So we're going to look at three samples that I've collected, one from before, one from just after the impact, and the third one into the Paleocene. What are we going to see? Well, so this is what I see when I'm looking at the microscope. They are pink because they're dyed. And all those little Ks are the Cretaceous, the typical Cretaceous taxa. Now, if I count them, uh, this is what happens. And notice the scale here. This is in centimeters. So each of those sample pretty much represents a centimeter. This is almost no time. This is very, very short. And we can see that there is a decrease in relative abundance from 20 to 30% to almost zero. So there is a great uh, evidence of extinction of the Cretaceous lore looking at the pollen record. And if we look at sample number two, the one that's just uh, within the boundary clay, this is what we see. We see a very monotonous word. This is the fern world that Ian's been talking about but viewed through the, the pollen and the, the spore record. And all these F here are fern spore. They're all the same species. And they thrive just after the impact. In fact, there is even 90% of those uh, samples that are within the boundary is just ferns. So that's very interesting. This is also a trend that we don't only see in the uh, Williston Basin in North Dakota, but pretty much worldwide, all across North America, and all the way down to New Zealand. And this is something that we can relate today as a response of devastation of uh, the environment by, uh, by plants. And ferns are usually uh, early colonizer of devastated landscape. This is what something that we can see, for example, in Hawaii after fresh lava flows, you have those little fiddleheads peeking out. Or after the eruption of Mount St. Helene, for example, where uh, like half of the volcano was destroyed and the ferns are recovering, wildfire also is, a, is another uh, example of that. And this is a parallel that we can do. Thanks to the fern spike, we can have an idea that forests were decimated globally and we lost that, that diversity. And this is a little example I, uh, that I saw in China when I was doing field work. There is a tiny landslide and you can see all those ferns uh, growing happily before all the other uh, plants come back. And number three, this is after the boundary, so we regain uh, a diversity, but also that is different. We have some mosses, conifers, palm trees, uh, but we have lost part of, uh, of our diversity and part of the, the Cretaceous taxa. So, uh, so we do have this disaster flora consisting of mostly the, the ferns back, and then we have a transition to recover into uh, a low diversity pelagian flora that's going to be of different composition, still angiosperm dominated but also uh, with, uh, with gymnosperm and, and palm that are, that are going dominant. So we have this indication of, of turnover. This is mimicked by the leaves. Uh, uh, I'm going to repeat a bit what Ian said, but we have those beautiful leaf assemblage in the Hell Creek. Diversity that can range from 80 taxa per site. It is actually amazing that if you can go in a forest today and pluck 80 different species of leaves, that's fairly rich. And uh, uh, there's a great one here. Uh, also, does anyone know what this is? That's a Cretaceous leaf from I'm giving a clue. Yeah, that's, that's hops. So this is great evidence that dinosaurs are at a great time. <laughs> 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 so plants actually did go extinct at the KT boundary and ecosystem did change drastically. These are the same banana graph that uh, Ian showed. Uh, there's just more of them, but the green, the Cretaceous diversity is, is just plummeting to become the yellow one. We're losing about uh, uh, 55 to 70% uh, to of the plant taxa. And what we find in the Paleocene is also a lot of plant sites. So we're not, not finding leaves. We're finding a lot of leaves. But that's basically the diversity you'll find. Uh, th three species and a few others that are not that common. So, so you're, lo you're, losing to you're losing complete diversity, as I said, between 50 cent or 78%, uh, depending on how you look at it in the, the Cretaceous part. And uh, that is also linked to the insect because now plants uh, are important to ecosystem. They are a, a, force, a source of food. 
and, and the collapse of the plant community will also uh, trigger the collapse of, of the food chain. Uh, that's actually seen very well with the insect. They are doing all sorts of things to plants. Uh, there is a couple examples of here, hole feedings, uh, uh, margin feeding like uh, uh, ants do, um, skeletonization, uh, little mines, so when uh, the insect just gonna deposit an egg and uh, the larvae will just uh, eat and grow at the same time, uh, uh, piercing and sucking and all sorts of, of those insect damage that are indicative of a, of, a, uh, of a specific species of insect, just like footprints, we're looking at footprints for dinosaurs, but you can also look at the prints that insect left, left marks on leaves. And all the specialized type disappear at the boundary. So we've got part of the plant record that, that disappear and those insects that like the plant that have gone are also dying at the same time. And this is exactly what is shown here uh, that was uh, done by Conrad Labandera at the Smithsonian. Uh, the also the important thing is that uh, the plant record can help reconstruct climate. So this is a summary of the, of the, of the Cretaceous. And looking at the leaf record, we can see that uh, the red curve here is actually the temperature based on the leaf. And we do have uh, about four degrees warming at the end of the Cretaceous. And you can see also the orange curve all the way to the right, which is the insect diversity. There is a, a, a little bit of an increase of diversity associated with the warming. I mean, it's get warm insects like that, they get more diverse. And this is seemingly correlated with uh, some of the pulses from the Deccan especially probably some of the first one in the Paleocene. It seems like most of the 75% of the eruption happened after, which is the Paleocene story of Coral Bluff uh, uh, has been telling us. But part of that uh, is also reflected in the Cretaceous ecosystem where you have a little bit of warming, more diversity of plants and insects, but it doesn't, seem any, it doesn't seem that this ecosystem was endangered in any way uh, before the asteroid impact where everything is happening. Of course, plants are not only a good source of food, they're also a, a source of shelter. And animals need shelter uh, to survive and, and to reproduce. And birds are probably some of the most impacted uh, by plants because they, they live in trees, they nest in trees, at, at least for some of them. And this is a study we've done uh, with my colleague Daniel Field, and uh, he has shown uh, looking at bird phylogeny. Uh, so the problem with birds is that they don't fossilize very well, and we have a huge gap of knowledge in, our, in, in the birds. Uh, across the KT boundary, but using uh, molecular phylogeny or looking at today's birth diversity and their DNA, we can trace their, uh, their tree of life. And it seems like by doing that, uh, if we look back down to the KT boundary, most of the uh, perching birds, the one that lived in the tree, actually got wiped out. And the one that survived are the ones that are ground dwelling. And the diversity of birds that we see today are birds that were flying, but living mostly on the ground. Uh, and this is reflected by the fact that we have at the same time the decimation of the forest uh, for, for a short period of time and that uh, although bird are, uh, dinosaurs have survived, uh, they are still among us, they also have suffered from the KT boundary mass extinction. So it's not a simple story of, yeah, dinosaurs were wiped out. Well, no, there's birds, but also birds suffered. So, uh, so there's a complex patterns of uh, ecosystem uh, collapse that, that we have deciphering. So of course this complex pattern of ecosystem collapse uh, led to what we know today. Uh, so that's karma. Uh, <laughs> uh, but birds are still doing pretty well considering they're the most uh, diverse group of terrestrial vertebrates today. So we are probably still living in the age of the dinosaurs. Um, and uh, what I would want to talk about as well is about uh, uh, this collapse of the forest communities. And uh, today we're talking about a lot about climate change for very good reasons. Uh, and this is a paper that has been summarizing how much we talk about climate change in the news. Uh, this is the number of journal articles for each of those, uh, each of those years. And we're talking a lot about it, uh, especially now. Uh, this is what we, t uh, well, of course, there is some events like the climate conferences and COP where you, you see those spikes. We're talking more about it. Uh, I don't know about today. We have probably some presidential tweets that make some spikes as well. <laughs> uh, this is biodiversity. This is how much we talk today about biodiversity in the news. And I think that this is also a challenge we should be looking more at. And basically in 30 years, uh, our interest in biodiversity hasn't changed much compared to uh, climate change, which we talk about 10 times more. Uh, because human activity also has impact, not only on climate, but also on biodiversity, even without the climate. And uh, this is a pretty striking example of what we do to biodiversity. 
by building cities and by building crops. This is an example of uh, the forests of Borneo that are being replaced by uh, uh, palm trees for, for palm oil. This right there is the KT boundary. <laughs> this is the KT boundary based on the loss of diversity, but also based on the time it takes. It take. The asteroid impact pretty much wiped out those forest ecosystem in a day, which is even faster than what we're doing now. That's probably today we're doing it at a rate of 40, 50 years. But that's very comparable, and I think that looking back down to the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, we can learn a lot about what we're doing to today's ecosystem. And that will be my uh, conclusion today. So thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? So uh, North Dakota was probably uh, in miles, maybe 25,000 miles from the impact. So it's it's fairly close. 25,000. 2,500, uh, 25, 25, sorry. <laughs> 2,500 miles to 3,000 uh, 3, miles, something like that, yeah. So it is fairly proximal, so we're expecting to see some uh, rather drastic effects. So, uh, so the impact, of course, blasted a lot of materials, but also it, gener it gener generated heat. I mean, there's a lot of energy there, and usually energy makes heat. Uh, and there is hypothesis of, of the heat actually igniting wildfire, which uh, we can trace down to those ecosystems there. Uh, it is not clear if the wildfire would have reached all the way uh, uh, to New Zealand, for example, but definitely the forests have been burning because of that. Uh, but still, we're, it's true that we we're pretty, still pretty close from the impact where we have the data to look at it. Yes? Um, what evidence is there for um, ground, ground dwelling birds surviving the extinction? So uh, the evidence is from the molecular phylogenies. So, uh, so if you look at, uh, at the tree of life uh, of birds, uh, using their DNA. So you, you basically use those characters from the DNA of modern birds to look to look at their ancestries, it seems like most of the ancestors of birds at the KT boundary are, are actually ground dwelling. So there's some traits of those birds, uh, they're basically on their feet and, and some not for the KT boundary, uh, a few of them that, that shows that there is, there is an ad adaptation for, for, ground dwellers, ground, for, for being ground dwelling. But at that, at that time, uh, most of the, of, the, of, the, of the nesting birds have disappeared. So there is another group of birds that Julia Clark had, had talked about, which is the, the, the marine birds, the Hesperonitiformes, who also disappear probably for different reasons. Uh, they're, uh, they're actually uh, based on a different ecosystem, a marine ecosystem. So, so that story doesn't work for them. Well, uh, they have the ability to grow from uh, spores directly, also maybe from rhizome through vegetative ways. And uh, so it's probably why they, they, they come back very quick. So they, they grow back from spores and they, they, uh, colon they, they colonize this environment very quick. Well, angiosperms are probably a little bit more slow. They need, uh, they need to make uh, seeds and uh, the seed has to germinate. So that process is probably slow by maybe a, 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 a couple of years or something like that. But it's enough to show the signal of, of disaster recovery where those opportunities stacks out, those ferns are coming back very quick. And then other uh, plants like angiosperm come back after. Uh, this is still something we're trying to understand. We have actually just got a grant from, from NASA, the Astrobiology uh, NASA grant. Just to investigate that, we're going to grow some ferns in different conditions and see what makes them so great at doing that. This is still something that... Uh, we'd like to explain. Thank you. Thank you.